Our guest on this edition of Citywide is Tom Allen, the Chief Executive Officer of Manhattan Media and the first declared candidate for mayor. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kendra. Great to be here. So, <clears throat> you're a business person, New Yorker. I would suspect most New Yorkers don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. Two years in the head of the uh, mayor election, you say you're going to be the next mayor. What's that all about? One of the great things about not being known by a lot of people is that my unfavorables are next to zero. Um, when people get to know me, I think they're going to get to like me. Um, I'm a businessman who's been successful in the city. I'm a former educator. I understand the complexities of business, the complexities of the education system in New York. I've created two successful public high schools. I think I'm going to win. Well, why are you running? Because I want to hand over a city to my kids in uh, 10 years. I have teen three teenagers here. That is a city where they can get jobs, a city where their friends can get jobs, where their children can be educated well. None of that's happening right now. You mean that you don't think that New York City is doing well? No, New York City is not doing as well as it should. Well, give us an example. Unemployment's uh, just below 10%. 25% uh, of kids who graduate from our city schools aren't prepared for college. Um, or I should say 75% are not prepared for college. It's a mess. And, and what do you attribute that to? Is that because the, you don't think the mayor's doing a good job? I think the mayor's done some things well. I think he's done, he's improved the city in certain areas like public health and gun control and crime. Education has not, the needle, needle has not moved enough in the last 10 years. I don't think the economy is doing as well as it should. Um, I think it, it'll take a, another businessman, again, who really understands the education system, who's been through the New York City education system and is taught in this education system to fix it. So what specifically would you do? Well, on the education front, there's a variety of things. There's no one magic bullet. <clears throat> the facilities in the city and city schools is, is not helping our kids and is driving teachers away. We have crumbling schools all over the city. I would have private developers uh, be sold air rights above public school buildings around the city in exchange for rebuilding schools. We need 21st century schools in order to educate kids for the 21st century marketplace. My daughter goes to a school on the Upper West Side on a great piece of, of real estate horrible school needs to be torn down and rebuilt. We need to expand charter schools. Uh, there have been great laboratories for education reform. Catholic schools uh, and parochial schools, we need to give parents tax credits uh, in order to revive that, se that sector and also to allow parents who live in low-income neighborhoods who don't have good public schools in their neighborhood uh, to, all to have opportunities. There's a variety of approaches. But how, how are you going to pay for that? I mean, selling off air rights on the Upper West Side is, is one thing. Selling off air rights in the South Bronx where there's no development going on is something else. Well, there's, there's 1,200 schools around the city. Um, I, you're right, not all 1,200 will be um, air rights uh, worthy, but there's probably three to 400 which can help be spread out throughout the system. And how would you pay for tax credits for non-public school students? Well, we're paying a lot of money for each kid to go to school, um, so there's no reason why we can't apply some of that money to, uh, to private schools and to parochial schools. So are you saying you take money out of the public school system to give it to the private schools? If need be, if it's, if it's gonna allow parents to have great choices. It, it really, what we have to do is give parents choice in this city. And that's what charter schools have done, and that's what we're trying to do in public schools as well. It's not a question of taking dollars out of anything. It's just, it's just giving parents more choices and kids more choices. Well, is that because you think it would, the public schools are beyond saving, or do you think they would improve the public schools? I'll give you a quick example, a personal example. In 1968, when I was, when I was six years old, my parents were uh, immigrants to this country shortly before that. Um, I went to the local public school in the Upper West Side, PS 166. If you recall, there was a teacher strike that year. I was out of school for two months, and my mother was freaking out. So what did she do? She sent me to the local parochial school, the yeshiva, on, on 104th Street. It was three or $4,000 a year, which she could ill afford. There's no reason, because the public schools were failing that year, that my mother should have to pay for parochial school. And that's, I think, true for many parents around the city. Um, it's not going to be a popular thing in the Democratic Party, <laughs> I know, but it's the right thing to do. Um, the, uh, the, the, the notion that it, you want a non-politician running a $60 billion government um, and which requires cooperation of other elected officials in the city council in Albany and, and Washington, if you don't have Mike Bloomberg's money, how does that work? Well, just because I'm not a politician, and, I, and quite frankly, I, w I don't want to ever be a politician. Even if I win, I want to be a public servant, and I think people have forgotten that. I've covered politics for 25 years. I covered Ed Koch, Rudy Giuliani, David Dinkins, um, and, and now Mike Bloomberg uh, as a community journalist. So I ended, and I know every politician in town. Um, so it's not like I haven't watched the levers of government being pulled by these people, and I've seen what they've done right and what they've done wrong. So it's not like I'd come in there purely as a novice. 
I've also run a media company over the past 20 years, one public company and one private company. I know how to run a multi-layered, multi-media manager company. Um, I can bring those skills to government. I've also been able to figure out new revenue streams when the economy was going badly. That's what needs to be done on the government level. I've also, I know when to cut back when the economy is bad, and I've done that in my business, and that's why we succeeded. That's what a mayor needs to do. And you don't believe that any of uh, other candidates who are currently public office holders are capable of doing that, that they are politicians and not public servants? There's a continuum of capability. I, I just think I'm much more capable than anybody else who might run. So how are you going to win? Um, there's a variety of reasons why I'm going to win. Um, first of all, I've, I've been campaigning for about three months now. I officially um, kicked off my campaign last night. Every time I've gotten in front of 20 or 30 people in a living room and I've explained my skills, my ideas, and my vision, I've walked out even more optimistic than I'm going to win. Um, I think people are yearning for somebody different, for a fresh face. I think this field, even though they're nice, capable people, has not generated excitement yet, which is why people are looking for somebody else. Um, undecided is winning right now. I'm going to get those votes. Well, it, it, it's, it's a pretty big city to win over the electorate 20 and 30 at a time. Well, um, if you've been following the campaign over the past couple of months, I've been gotten coverage from the New York Times, from, uh, uh, I've been on Brian Lehrer's show, New York One. I think I'm, I'm getting a fair amount of attention right now, and it's very early. So I've got two years to get my name out there. I've been a media person for the past 25 years. I know how to um, present myself to the media, and I think I'm going to be very effective doing that. You actually released a television commercial recently. Um, uh, was that um, just released into, into sort of the, the net, or did you, have you actually paid to have that on broadcast? Oh, it was on New York One. We did a one-day buy. It was an election day ad. It was specifically targeted for election day to show people that even though they didn't have a choice this year to vote because the party bosses didn't want them to vote this year, they will have a choice in, in 2013, an independent, strong, bold Democrat who's going to run. Well, when you say the party bosses didn't want them to vote. There were no offices that were in my neighborhood except well, there, judge that were up. Well, there was, one, there, was, there, was one very, there was one very famous election that, that s seemed to be a litmus test, test for the president this year, Bob Turner against uh, David Weprin in Brooklyn. Why was that in September and not November? Because the party bosses didn't want there to be a general election. If that had been on, in November instead of September, I think David Weprin or whoever the Democratic Party had nominated might be the, uh, might be the Congress person now. Let's take a look at the commercial. Sure. It's election day, and you're not voting. That's just how the Democratic and the Republican bosses like it. Without real choice, we're forced to re-elect the same old career politicians. My name is Tom Allen. I'm a former public school teacher and the publisher of a family of community newspapers. The last thing I am is a politician. I'm running for mayor in 2013 because New York needs a tough, independent mayor who isn't beholden to party insiders. So your message is, I'm not a politician. Um, are you seeking the support of politicians? I, I'll seek the support of anybody who can vote in New York City, but I'm not currently seeking anybody's specific support. Um, it's two years out. Um, I'm trying to get my message out there. This was an introductory message. Um, that defines who I'm not. Now I'm going to start defining who I am. Successful businessman, educator, creator of two uh, public high schools that are successful uh, on the Upper West Side and Upper East Side, parent, um, and lifelong New Yorker. Once I make that case, I think politicians and everybody else will come support me. And what about the unions? I'd like to get their support. Um, I'm not going to pander for it like other people might. Um, I was a member of the United Federation of Teachers for two years, so I think I might be the only person running who actually has been a member of a union. Um, I was proud to be a, a UFT member. I'm, I was proud to be a teacher. Um, but there's a lot of things that have to change in the city, and one of them is pension reform. So tell us about that. Well, when, when Mike Bloomberg became mayor in, uh, in uh, 2001, and, and uh, Council Member Quinn uh, became the speaker, the, uh, I believe the annual budget for pensions was about a billion dollars, and what was then a $40 billion budget. Uh, fast forward 10 years, it's a $65 billion budget, gone up 40%, and pensions have gone up to $8 billion a year. That's an unsustainable number. Um, we are doing a disservice not just to our taxpayer base, but to those union members. Don't you think uh, the unions in some way um, earned or won additional pension benefits by agreeing to moderate wage increases, uh, basically push the problem off for the future, but you know, help the city get through some very tough times? 
perhaps, but I don't think that's necessarily served the city or served the union members. I mean, again, I was a teacher 25 years ago at Stuyvesant High School. Um, I was being paid $20,000 a year uh, to be a teacher. I knew that I wasn't going to do that for very long because I couldn't support a family in New York City on $20,000 a year. I would much rather pay people a much higher base salary and to attract the best and the brightest than backloading things with a huge pension uh, uh, bill. So I think that's what needs to be done in terms of pension reform. I'm not talking about taking money away from union members. I'm talking about front-loading it so we get the best and the brightest. What kind of economic policies would you have and how would they be different from Mike Bloomberg's? Well, first of all, um, I think we have to shrink the size of government and shrink the size of the budget. Um, and one idea that I want to pilot is um, allowing city workers to work part-time, 20 hours or 30 hours a week. Um, I'm a parent of three teenagers, um, and I've had to make the choice, as have many other parents in the city, whether to work a full-time job or whether to help child-rearing. Um, there's no reason why parents in the city, fathers and mothers, have to make that choice. Um, so I think, I think city government can pilot that program, and I think we can probably cut some, um, some waste out of government that way. Um, I believe there's other sectors in this economy that I think we can bring into the city um, in order to bring jobs back to New York. The mayor should be applauded for his technology initiative on Roosevelt Island. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in coming here, so I think we can probably allow two or three schools to open in New York. So from technology to higher education uh, to biotechnology, I believe manufacturing should come back to New York. If we're going to try to attract innovators in uh, the technology sector, they should watch their products being built in, in parts of the city. Um, so through tax incentives and through uh, other types of economic incentives, I think we can build the base uh, of pro-growth, pro-jobs industries. We're going to continue our conversation with Tom Allen when Citywide continues right after this. Hi, I'm Matthew Goldstein. November is CUNY month and a great time to visit CUNY campuses in all five boroughs. Learn why more CUNY students than ever are winning national awards and scholarships. Our 24 colleges and professional schools are holding open houses for you. Meet world-class faculty, ask about financial aid, the time to start working on your future is now. Visit cuny.edu slash CUNY month. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Tom Allen, publishing executive candidate for mayor of New York City. So before the break, you were describing yourself. You're business friendly, want to cut waste in government expenses, and you're not going to pander. Mm -hmm. Sums up the campaign pretty, pretty well. Pretty well. So let's test that. Sure. Um, the internet is uh, free and pretty widely available to people, mm -hmm. but notwithstanding that, government spends millions of dollars a year on legal notices in uh, newspapers and requires every new business to publish a notice in a newspaper uh, that I would say virtually nobody ever reads. So would you support legislation to eliminate uh, the requirement that government and new businesses have to publish in newspapers? <laughs> Um, you're hitting in my backyard here. Um, well, um, I believe that there is a public right to know, but you raise a good point. Um, I do think that there's overpublishing, and there probably the requirement to publish in two newspapers may be overreach. Maybe publishing in one newspaper is correct. I don't believe putting on the internet is something that's necessarily going to be um, um, easily reachable. But you raise a very good point, and I think it should be looked at. But I also don't think there's thousands of newspapers in New York State, I should say, I should say hundreds of newspapers that rely on those for their, uh, their sole source of advertising, and a bill like that would kill hundreds of newspapers in New York State. So we should all be subsidizing this obsolete industry? Not, not we all. It's business owners, first of all. Um, and second of all, it's, um, there is a, a public right to know. But I, I agree with you, they're overpublished. I, I ask you this not just to be cute, but you know, one of the advantages of starting a campaign so early is it, it gets you uh, some sense of you know what the next two years are going to be like. Very good question. What? Tell us a little bit about your family, your your life growing sure. up. Sure. What does this mean? You know, <coughs> is everybody on board with the kind of exposure you're going to be getting? It's a very good question. Um, first of all, I, I grew up on the Upper West Side. I'm the, I'm the son of Holocaust survivors and immigrants to the city in 1956. My parents came here um, from Eastern Europe and uh, actually. They lived in Paris right before they, they moved here. Um, so I grew up in rent-controlled housing on the Upper West Side on 86 Riverside Drive. Um, as a kid, I think I mentioned before, I went from briefly in public school to yeshiva, then uh, moved to Europe for about a year and a half when I was in my teens, uh, came back to New York, went to a private school on the Upper West Side for two years, and then Stuyvesant High School. Um, I fell in love with the newspapers when I was in high school. I became the editor of the Stuyvesant High School newspaper. 
went off to Cornell, became one of the editors of the Cornell Daily Sun, and then came back to New York and studied at Columbia Graduate School of Journalism, got my degree in, in uh, my master's degree in journalism, and came back to New York hoping to get a job. Um, I worked at the New York Times for about a year or two as a clerk and a copy boy, hoping to make my way up that, that uh, chain there. Um, while I was there, uh, I was offered a job to be the editor of a local newspaper called the West Side Spirit. This was in 1986, 25 years ago. Um, and it was a dream come true to be able to edit a newspaper in the, er the neighborhood where I grew up in. Um, it was 86. The city was ramp rampant with crime and corruption, and you know, no young journalist could have asked for a better laboratory to cut their teeth. Um, I gained a reputation of being an investigative journalist who went after a lot of politicians, which I did. Um, with neither fear nor favor, and um, I made my reputation there. Eventually, gravitated to the business side in the early '90s. Uh, became the publisher of that newspaper. It was the first of what became a 23 chain, uh, 23 newspaper chain that became a public company. I rose to become the vice president of that public company. In 2001, I did a management buyout of four of the newspapers that I've been running, and I then built a media company with a couple of private equity investors. Um, that's what I've done the last 10 years. Um, I have three children, three teenagers, um, who I adore, who are the, 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 the best things I've ever done. Um, and um, my biggest challenge over the next two years is, become, is being a good father, uh, being a good uh, CEO, and also being a candidate. Um, so far, I've been trying to maintain that balance as best I can. My kids are now on board. My wife um, is, I think, on board. Um, I am not going to drag them into a public campaign because they've got to get into college and high school and all the other things they've got to do. Um, my wife has her own uh, life and her career. And um, so far, so good. Sounds like, because you're a successful business person, you might be one of those one percenters we've been hearing so much about, uh, or close to it, or at least uh, uh, live in a neighborhood uh, that's, uh, that's pretty affluent. But you yourself have been supportive of the Occupy Wall Street movement and uh, spent the night down there. Uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that an awful lot of people, labor leaders, politicians, others, went down there, voiced their support, and then went home. They didn't seem to get the idea of an occupation. So tell us about that experience. Why did you do it? What did it mean to you? And sure. I mean, first of all, I'm just going back to what I said before. I'm the son of immigrants, and, I, and my parents came here you know, with, with no money. And I grew up very middle class, lower middle class in New York. Um, I put myself through college. I worked and when I was a senior, senior in high school at Stuyvesant. I had three jobs after school. Um, I worked uh, for part of college and every summer to put myself through school. And I, and I had lots of loans, just like the kids of today did, and I paid that off over the first 10 years after I got out. By the way, working as a teacher and a journalist, which were not lucrative careers. Um, so I remember, and I still know what it's like to have to earn a living and to be on the edge. Um, and I really feel for the kids on, uh, down on Occupy Wall Street and in other parts of this country, because they, basically they've been sold a bill of goods. Um, Tuitions have gone up astronomically in the past uh, 20 years. I mean, I know when I, when I went to Cornell back in the, uh, in the early 80s, it was 15,000 a year. Now it's 60,000 a year. So kids are coming out with huge, huge loan commitments, and they can't find a job. So what kind of deal is that? That's not fair. I knew when I got out of college, I was probably going to get a job. Uh, the, even though the economy then wasn't great, I never had a doubt that I was going to get a job in New York. Um, it was $20,000 a year, but it was a job so I could make my rent payment, my loan payments, and, um, and then hopefully have a few dollars left over for dinner. Um, so I totally empathize with what's going on in this movement. I don't think Wall Street's the problem. I think it's, a, it's sort of a, what do they say? Um, uh, you know, a victory has a thousand fathers, defeat is an orphan. Well, this is a situation where I think defeat has a number of, uh, of, of, of people responsible for it. Not Wall Street, not, uh, I mean, the federal government, uh, state, city government, everybody's complicit in the mortgage crisis, in the inequality in this country. And I thought by going down there and sleeping there, not just would I have six or seven hours to spend talking to people, which I did all night, trying to understand what's going on, but to show a little bit of solidarity with people who are in pain. Well, the message of Occupy Wall Street seems to have um, a couple of components. But the main one is, is that the influence of the business community is so disproportionately mm -hmm. large. The people at, and again, the people at the top mm -hmm. um, have corrupted the political process mm -hmm. um, so that it, the system is, is rigged. So in that scenario, it's not that government has made it bad for Wall Street, it's that Wall Street has used the government to make it bad for everybody else. Not just Wall Street, but special interests in general. And listen, I, I think, listen, the money has had a corrosive effect on politics for many years. You know, from Jack Abramoff to now John Liu, 
We have seen what people have done in government in pursuit of, of dollars to support their campaigns, and in some cases, you know, the corruption of their, from them personally. Um, this young generation gets that and, and makes that connection. And what I was really fascinated by that night was that these were intelligent people. They could be on any college campus in this country, or, you know, sleeping out on the quad protesting. There was one young man down there who explained to me why the Glass-Steagall Act revocation in 93 by Bill Clinton was the beginning of the end of our financial system. You don't hear that in most protest movements. This is not a nihilistic movement where they want just to burn down buildings. They want to talk about it. They want to explain why things have gone wrong. They want their voice to be heard, and I think they've done that in spades. So what happens next? I think they have to become a political movement, which you know, I hope they do that. I hope, I hope whether it's in the 2012 uh, presidential campaign or I hope in my mayoral campaign in 2013, this becomes, like the Tea Party, a very powerful, strong movement that gets people elected who are in, in line with their uh, message. So give us an example of how that philosophy would play out as policy if you were the mayor. How would I handle this if this were? No, no, well, you can talk about how you would handle it. But, but also how policy. But, but you know, you're, you have a perspective, you have a point of sure, view. Sure, sure. And so translate oh, sure. that into a specific okay. thing that you would do. Okay. We have an achievement gap in the city that starts in kindergarten. Universal pre-K is something that, that for some reason the city has given up on and this country has given up on. I would try to find the dollars to fund universal pre-K. Um, and again, there, you know, there's a variety of ways to do that. That's one specific example because if you, and, and you have to sort of carry that on throughout. City University, where we're sitting right now, has become a viable option over the past 10 years for, for great students. Uh, state state uh, universities are getting better in New York State. We need to give, you know, because listen, all the studies show that there's a 4% uh, unemployment rate for people who are college graduates, 14% of high school graduates, and I think it's in the 20s for people who dropped out of high school in this country. So education is a very solid predictor for future success. If we start at a young age and educate people well and continue that throughout. But Tom, I, d I don't think I've heard anything that Christine Quinn and Bill Thompson, Bill de Blasio, Scott Stringer, John Lowe, I don't think that any of them would say anything different about education. Well, that, I don't think that's true, Ken. Um, they don't have a nuanced understanding of education. Um, they don't realize that the fact that Catholic schools in the city are dying out is a huge problem in the city. That used to be the refuge for people in poor neighborhoods in the city where their kids would go to get great educations and great discipline. Um, charter schools, which some of these uh, uh, potential candidates are opposing, are part of the solution. Um, rebuilding our schools is part of the solution. Um, De-emphasizing high-stakes testing, which I think has corrupted our system, is part of the solution. Um, get, giving teacher, teachers bonuses, merit bonuses, on, because they've succeeded, not because of metrics of, um, of how well their kids are testing, but because the principal has, has decided that, that's what, that these are the teachers that deserve that. Those are the kind of changes. Those are very nuanced things. I don't think Scott Stringer or Christine Quinn or Bill Thompson can give that kind of explication that I can. Aside from education, yeah. if there was, I guess you mentioned pension reform, mm -hmm. if there was one major <laughs> initiative as mayor that you think would take us in a clearly different <laughs> direction from what Bloomberg and the city council have done over the last uh, eight years, what would that be? Um, I think it's, it's aggressively... I think one of the things that the mayor's done, <coughs> excuse me, and one of the things also that, that the council's let him do is outsource a lot of things in the city. There's many co contracts that go out for bidding that go outside of New York State. We should keep all the dollars here in New York. Um, the Board of Education, I think, wastes a lot of money each year. I'm sorry, Department of Education wastes a lot of money each year on these contracts that are basically no big contracts. Um, there's a lot that's being done economically that is not being thought through. You know, a mayor that, who prides himself on his financial acumen and a city council speaker who wants to be the next mayor, to have them allow the city budget to grow by 40% in a decade, I think is wrong. Um, I would change that. My thanks to Tom Allen, the chief executive of Manhattan Media, candidate for mayor. I'm Ken Fisher. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Citywide.